it overtakes the tree eventually mm -hmm. until all the bones are brown on the tree and show a little bit of oh. gross. Like my, um, it's not my tree, it's just in my yard. Mm -hmm. It's Eric's tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did it and mm -hmm. never took it with it.
so this the catalog software it went from seven ninety five to eleven ninety eight. Right. Um, that goes to so that's a, a so side vendor. we right. actually yes so it's this it's um, this company called Atrium Book System. We actually expended this eleven ninety this year. Oh okay. So it was budgeted for that, and we that's something that. You know, it's going to come from somewhere else in our budget this year, but that's what it was. That was the cost of it. This is a new, the software is new. We're still in our going into our second year with it. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, so we, a little bit we underestimated the value of this additional product, the OPEC portion of it, uh, which allows patrons to access their accounts and renew online and see the catalog. It also allows other libraries to access our catalog online. And it's really important for the library to be a member of the New Hampshire Library Association uh, and do interlibrary loans. So, so if you didn't um, have this, we wouldn't have that ability to borrow a book from Durham? So what happened was, like, four years ago, the library, the state library had a database of where you would go, you log into this database and you would find who else had uh, interlibrary loans or like titles that you needed for interlibrary loan and you would request it through that. That database crashed and oh. died. Like they horrible that they still have not replaced it. So well. that database was also where we and, and it's required that you do this. We have to update our catalog in that database. So the software that we had did not allow us to do that. Um, the system that they had to do it manually did not really work. So this new software uh, automates that. So we're now current with, with our catalog. It does our deletes. Um, the state library has just, I think they were launching it in December. They're going to have a new interlibrary loan up, system up and running. But again, it's reliant on the interface with this software. The, the, the software that we had before, this live world software, is like probably the most basic software that is, okay. is out there. And, this, and I have to say, the cost, so while it seems like a job, the cost of actually like what the bigger libraries use is like 10 times this. So this is actually, it's a pretty cost-efficient way for us to still maintain our viability within the state library. When we opened um, and wanted to keep the catalog digitally, rather than helping the spiral of what we were to write down what they checked out and hope the best, um, library world was the cheapest way that we could do it. And it was like 400 a month, and it was most of the work was a year, I'm sorry. For a year, and it was mostly because there was a lot of manual operations on our end. Mm -hmm. um, and what's amazing about this software is, I, I, since I've been using it as a patron now, it's, it's really pretty impressive what it can do for you. Yeah. It's your printed receipts of what's checked out. It helps get reports so you can track the materials better. There's a lot more functionality for it in front library and externally. So. Yeah. I mean, it automatically, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but it automatically emails you when your books are overdue. Mm -hmm. And so I do the overdue letters every month, and it is a dramatic decrease in the amount. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, our material are coming back. Does it, does it help prevent losses? It does in that people are reminded. Yeah. I mean, I think that emails are pretty relentless. If you have it overdue, I think even walking out with the receipt. Yeah, I, think I mean, we used to, we had a stamp, we stamped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the kids, that was the big thrill, but you got to stamp your own books with the, we had to turn the date and do the stamps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But people don't live that way anymore. You know, you're not looking in the back of the book for the stamp. Yeah. <laughs> you're looking for the email, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, statistically, if I look at like the letters that I sent out before we had, like, you know, 2017 versus the letters I sent them. 2019, yeah, we're losing a lot less materials because I'm 
having to contact a lot of fewer people. And I don't contact people until materials are 60 and 90 days overdue. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty overdue stuff. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it does cut down on I mean, that would, that would help justify, in my mind, the increased expense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Is, is well, I think that, and, and I do, I can't emphasize enough like, our, the importance of us being part of the New Hampshire library yeah. system. Mm -hmm. yep. You have access to so many more. It's like having yeah. like everything. And then you can think of someone in the state is going to have it. So, and how does it get here? So there's a van system. Still does that. Yeah. Okay. And our van stop is Summerford, so okay. I go over once a week to Summerford. We used to have a van stop. They cut the budget. <laughs> <laughs> we were the first to go. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, it's nice because then I, you know, can touch base with some of the library. Mm -hmm. you know, it's actually not that, that big a deal. <coughs> Do you have any questions, Jessica? No. Mm -hmm. Is it so the we don't have a long term lease there. I, I assume it's, it's a year to year at least. Um, it is year to year, but we do have a plan. Like he, we talked to him last year, and there is a plan in place for like a five year. Like this is what the increases will be. He okay. he gave us a break on the increase this year because of the money that we're putting into renovating. Oh. So um, it was less of an increase than his the proposal that we have, but. They, they, um, you know, our bathroom is the mills that takes care of, of all of that. The elevator, which provides accessibility throughout the building. Mm -hmm. The parking lot is mostly takes care of. <laughs> I mean, they're good in the winter, but the parking lot is doing, it looks like something from a zombie uh, movie with the plants growing up the back of the building at this point. But, I mean, overall, they've been very generous hosts, and they appreciate the reciprocal relationship back and forth of what the library brings to their, you know, the value it brings to their building. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't think he's increasing our rent any more than he is anybody else. In no, the building, so. that building has gotten, it went from having a pretty high vacancy rate to a very low vacancy yeah. rate. Yeah. So every time I ask him, cars yeah, there. yeah, it's full. There, yeah. yeah. So he's, um, I think he's actually being quite generous, yeah. to be honest. Mm -hmm. Do you keep statistics on like visitation and? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a out. monthly report and it compares year to year, and I have those numbers. We have those numbers going back at least eight years. Yeah, I'm just out of curiosity. I'd love to see the the value that it's providing. You know, residents. Yeah. Does Emily so, include that in the minutes every month? Or does it no, I mean, she doesn't include it in the minutes. Yeah. It's in the, we, we, it in the we minute have, book. Yeah, we have a binder in the library. Well, so yeah. But you can I'm, see the 2018 time report. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can see any, all of them going back, really, because it is always in the time report. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just, I just queued in on the, so the library system and um, library, uh, assistant librarian. Yeah. So those are represent increase in hours as well as um, rate. Yes. So uh, the assistant librarian, her name is Jessica. She has she's doing more um, library work for me. She's the one who posts the videos. She does a lot of the cataloging. She's taking over cataloging. She's now doing a lot of the interlibrary loan stuff for me. Um, she works in another library. She has years and years of library mm -hmm. experience. She's a, she's a really valuable employee. Um, just in terms of like the hours she works versus the work that she gets done mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. And then um, my library assistant is somebody who, um, you know, she does she can she does the basic functions of the library. She doesn't necessarily have like the library tech tech right. yeah. I mean, yeah. she's learning sort of as she goes, but she's 
little less skilled. What does it represent in terms of extra hours, like from 10 to 13? Or? Uh, for Jessica, she was working nine, let's see, she was working five. I could probably figure it out. So she, she works five, she was working a five hour shift on Wednesdays and then three Sundays a month, three, four hour days. Okay. So it was nine, five to nine hours and then she was interested in more hours and I had more hours open up because I had another employee leave and so now she's working an additional four hours a week on Thursdays. Oh, I see. So libraries, assistant librarian number two goes to zero. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, again, it's a little confusing. Yep. A little no, I understand that. Okay. And you're all set? Yeah. You're good. You're good? Okay. Well, and I will, I will forward you a narrative okay. as well. Um, and I assume you're looking for like sort of larger expenditures that are on our horizon, or do you how do you have any? No. no. Okay. So. Any other changes though, if you anticipate like you know even if it's not capital, if there are changes that have to happen within the next three to five years or something that are gonna that could benefit from planning. Like right. if you think you're going to increase hours and then over three years you're going to try to staff it for 15 more hours a week or something and you're okay. working toward that goal. Like things like that so that you can sort of project out what your budget might be doing over the next few years. Okay. All right. No problem. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Very nice. Are we your only budget? Oh, no. no. Oh, no. We're just scheduled every couple hours. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, here we go. Ours is easy. Welcome to stay. She went over that. Is she here? Um, she said she she. I saw her in the parking lot, and she said she'd be back at six thirty. Oh, okay. So I'll check and make sure she's not here. Okay. If you are otherwise. Um, Free. The other two, not Denise, who's signing things, but um, looking over CIP, she provided a narrative, and I don't know if we've had a chance to look at it, but the CIP and its narrative are completely. I kind of looked at it. This current one? Yes. Yeah, that one. <laughs> It's like an I spy book. <laughs> yes, that's what I was like. Yeah, because I printed the spreadsheet in it and they didn't change the paper back. So. This is bigger than legal. That's ledger. It's ledger. Yeah. Oh, ledger. There you go. 11 by 17. Enjoy. Yeah, um, your lights are flashing. 
All right. Um, I don't know what to say about that. You know, we'd have to find money elsewhere in the budget until such a time that they could find another location, or else perhaps it would be dire enough that it could be closed. But we would have to really do some research about that because it would not be the first easy answer that think people might think it is. Right. We'd have to yeah. explore whether or not that could really be an option. Mm. I wouldn't offhand immediately think so. It, yeah. So what about the rest of the budget items? The trustees put the budget together with the library, with the library director, yeah. and there's not really anything the select board can do with it. If you disagree with points about it, you can choose to vocally support it or not support it, but you can't amend it the way you could amend a different department's budget. Hmm. And then, you know, if the people, if the budget committee were to cut the budget by any percentage or by any flat dollar amount, the select board, if that, if that were the final budget that were to be approved, the select board would have to reallocate the budget cuts in such a way that the library was not hit by any greater percentage than any other department. Yeah, but they would still get a hit. They would if get they, a hit, yeah. but, you know, if it's $100,000, if it's $100,000, yeah. $100, that's going to, you know, by dollar amount, mm -hmm. affect police, for example, mm -hmm. more than it would library, mm -hmm. because you're going to go by the percentage. Mm -hmm. So the cemetery must be a similar thing? No, they have different rules. Okay. And they may have di like similar sorts of protections, but n they're not covered under this same law. Did you see that Chuck sent out up-to-date rec financials I did not see it today? Okay. It does not include the buses that you just approved, of course, okay. but is otherwise up-to-date. Up okay, thank you. Which includes the final payroll. So okay. payroll expenses will be So done. it would only be these two or anything smaller? That comes that out now, yeah. So it's a pretty close to what it is, okay. And the revenue as well, the expense and yes. revenues. No, I didn't see him. Okay.
have to sign this. Oh, this is copy. Do you have the original? That's okay. Um, I do have the original. So the, the, those things change. Oh, she, um, did you print this out? Yeah, but she, this is yours, this is mine. It's the same thing. It should be this. Yes, she, she, um, she gave me a different number to plug in. Um, because she didn't calculate it correctly. Hold on. I think it should be 3751. Looking at the elections and regulations? Yeah, the first, this one here. Oh, a lot of the percentages are wrong. Or the proposed change is wrong. Well, this is wrong. It should be this, I believe. Okay. It's a different one between 19 and 3. So I have 28,764 representing a 15% increase. Um, I, yeah, but it's column E. Which says it's twenty five oh thirteen. That is correct is last, for last year. No, that it says proposed change. It's mm -hmm. not a proposed change. That's it's so I last agree. year's budget. Twenty. If you I look agree. at column B, oh, so the change is thirty seven fifty one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. Because I was looking at all the percentages and they. Yeah. Didn't yeah. Sense. Yeah. It is correct in um in my spreadsheet. Oh, okay. The full spreadsheet. So. What I printed out for you for Monday is correct. This past Monday, the full spreadsheet that I gave you, okay. it's correct in there. Oh, okay. But the one that we gave us is here yeah, that's and the one we had, had previously. Yep. Is, okay. All right. The line six is not right either, right? Well, there's no number in column D. So, um, well, there, yeah, but there should be. Yep. Yep. And 
same um, She did not fill out payroll taxes because she knew that that was an automatic calculation. Okay. It just kind of... So I did put... Everything out. Yeah, okay. I hear you. So I did put it into the spreadsheet here and um, based on her request, the payroll taxes um, are $24.15. For 2020. For, for 2020, the proposal for payroll taxes yeah. that would match her request yeah. would be $2,450. 2415 Yes. Okay. Which is a difference of $447. $447. Or 22.7%. 22.7%. Okay. Are we considering the auditor's recommendation for a CAS register? She is not. Uh, in her in her budget request, she is not. Okay, and, um, and she's aware of the, what the request was and she's choosing not to? I don't know that she oh. has read it and is aware. Okay. It has been a conversation in the past, but whether or not, I don't believe she's read the, you know, I don't know that she's aware that it came up again this year. Okay. Um, it can come out of the executive supply line. It's not, I mean, depending on what kind of model is chosen, you can purchase one for approximately a hundred dollars. So, okay. okay. I don't, I don't see it as an enormous expense that we can't otherwise absorb. So you don't think it has to go in as a, its own line? It certainly could, but, um, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would put it under executive and either take it out of supplies or you can take it out of, um, office equipment slash maintenance, which is really earmarked more of the cost, but you could put it in that line because it's an appropriate line for that kind of thing. Good people there. Just me? Just well, you? Well, th th they're in increments, oh, so this sorry. is your time slot. We have a wedding in three weeks. Go, go, go. Hello, all. Hello. Hi. Welcome to your Thank you. first meeting. First one I have. It's not on, which makes it oh. quiet. It's like the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Here we music. go. Put music in the background. I know. Okay, you can uh, go so. ahead and start. Oh, so what do I present? What I've given you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, what I prepared for my budget this year is to increase my hours to 23 hours a week and uh, my election stipends to cover the additional hours for per election. And uh, I want to let you know that the um, ballot wages have gone up because of the four elections and, and now our um, Supervisors are also required to do water and sewer meetings, so those are additional meetings. They were never required before? They were. They just they weren't. didn't. Yeah, so now that they are. Uh, the meals, there's an increase obviously again for elections. Um, I anticipate to continue with an increase with vital records. Um, the, it, the requests have more than doubled. The real ID has caused a real uptick. If anybody has been 
widowed, remarried, name change. They won't take the small birth certificates we were all issued back in the day. They have to have the large ones. Insurance companies no longer take a marriage certificate that you got from the um, church. Everybody has to go through the long form process. Um, so big uptick in that. Another thing that I didn't note that we've had a big uptick is a lot of banks and communities charge for notary service, and we don't. And we're finding that a lot of the notaries that we're doing are Rollinsford residents. I think like the word is out. Rollinsford does it for nothing. <laughs> well, a notary can only charge so much. So what is right. the bank charging them? Uh, so I think it's between five and ten dollars. Some places are getting. That's not allowed. I mean, no, it's I think much it less. Is. Well, I'm, unless I've been a notary for years and it was like really small amounts that you could charge. It wasn't worth the paperwork to do it. Right. <laughs> and then you have to claim it. You have to do right. the, the whole yeah. process. But yeah. um, you know, we're finding a lot. We're doing probably sometimes two to five notaries a week. Hmm. After 9-11, everything has changed. Mm -hmm. There's no more alias names. They, they're just so tough about you identifying yourself. So all your records have to be, everything has to be notarized. Everything has to be, your paperwork has to line up. And, we're just in it, it's falling on us. Hmm. So, and then, um, uh, so I, I have reached out to the DMV. Apparently there is no additional cost for us to add a second system. But as Carolyn pointed out, um, I've reached out to them and asked if it can be added to Andrea's system without having to add another computer in the office. Mm -hmm. And then we share a printer. Mm -hmm. So then the um, expenses would be minimal for us to have that second terminal. And they allow that for it to be on Andrew's computer? They haven't gotten back to me. Okay. Okay, so you have your own computer and you have an, a, DMV. a DMV computer. Yeah, okay. And that was a requirement that you had to have a separate one back Years then? Years ago, the state provided you with the printer and the computer. Mm -hmm. And then, little by little, first they took the printers away, now they're not providing the new computers. They're pushing them on the towns. So, and, you know, one system always worked, but when it's not tax season, and I've got three or four people in line, Andrew could be helping them, but we only have one DMV system. Mm -hmm. So, it would be helpful. And, and I also stated, I would love to see whether we, at some point, and this is kind of like down the future, but pick up a person who's a floater who could be certified through the DMV so that there are three of us that can, you know, whether it's vacations or somebody's out sick or, God forbid, we both, you know, have to have a surgery or something that's crazy and we're out for six weeks. I mean, somebody else should be trained to be able to you have that much activity, you need three people trained to oh, do it? Well, we're up, I think, uh, I've exceeded last year's figures already, I think, in motor vehicle. It, it, it's exceeding. That's all I can say. It's, when I started here, I probably did 8 to 12 transactions a day. There are times I'm doing 40 a day. Um, and you have to remember, it, like, I think when you live here in town, you think, oh, well, we're not really growing. But in one quarter, we sold 30 houses. So every, all 30 of those houses have a motorcycle, a trailer, multiple cars, dog. It, it adds to the workload. Because everybody else that's gone out, now we're going to do them all new. Especially when they move from another state, it's more of a transaction to retitle, re-register. It's, it's, it's busy. It's a, it's a busy office, and I just think, and again, I said in the future, I'm thinking there should be a third person that knows how to, and I'm not saying three people in the office. Mm -hmm. I'm saying a third person who, on the outside chance that 
So you wouldn't need to have three computers dedicated to No, no, no. Okay, so it would be oh. someone that could come in, so like for instance in. Chuck, could right. come in and utilize yes. Exactly. One of your computers exactly. and do it if someone is out. So, right. Okay. And not even if somebody's out. If, you know, I had four people in line today. Mm -hmm. It's a customer service thing. It would be nice if somebody could say, hey, you know, let me help you over here. Let me do this renewal. Mm -hmm. And so you're new. You're, you're, you're all somewhat new. But when I started here, I came from a city and things were much more advanced. And I've always been... I've always done customer service, so I'm about getting things moving, getting people in and out, doing things fast. So the first year, um, I started the mail-in renewal program, because prior to that, people didn't know how much they owed, and they didn't have an option other than to come in. So now we have that. And then the second year, I put in the um, dog registration program. We were handwriting 500 dog tickets. Like what type of dog, color, so now we have a program for that. And then the third thing I did was for um, elections, we were hand counting. And we got into the ballot machines. So I'm aware of programs that are out there that are going to even make what we do even faster and more efficient, but they're expensive. Another $10,000, $15,000. And I guess what I wanted to say to the board is just Keep in mind, I have a really small budget compared to like highway and police and our other departments in town. I don't ask for a whole lot. I try to break it up, a new project each year. But the reason that I do it is to improve customer service, to make it, you know, a little bit more streamlined. And, you know, it's a pretty small budget. And all the monies are coming in and they're safe and it's good and it's what's running the town and it's a... It's a good investment to, you know, keep it coming in as, as well as it is. So do you think there's an appetite to, uh, to charge for notary services? I almost think we should, but I'd have you to look into up what to the, ten dollars. Is it up to ten? And what is the pay? Is it, it's a real paperwork hassle, or do we just keep track of how many notaries we do? Well, the state of New Hampshire doesn't require you to keep a log book. Oh, unless that's changed. Well, I mean, it is an income. I mean, we, we just feel that we're doing more and more of them. I, I thought you had it. to keep a logbook if you charged for it. Well, well, you probably do if you charge. I don't yeah. charge. So, I mean, I, I used to keep a logbook when I was working with a business and having to do the business ones. But, I mean, for someone who I know or, or who proves ID, I don't necessarily because it, I don't charge. We if you have. charge, you probably have to. We never have, but I'm, I'm guessing we will have to keep track of it. I just thought it's kind of a... I mean, it's a I'm not even saying charge $10, but... It's an income. Something to I just think that... I think it's a nice feature for people in town, mm -hmm. but we're getting... I'm saying some of, half of what we're doing is from South Berwick. People that are comfortable. And I, I just think the word is out that we're all two dozen charge. Oh, so you're saying maybe South Berks charge Maybe out of residence. Yeah. Maybe well, can charge. they do that? Do they allow you know. to have fees sometimes and fees not all the time? Or yeah. or do you have to say this is the all the time? Different than in New Hampshire, as in the requirements. For well, order. right. I just mean if she's going to charge, can are we allowed to have a distinction between charging residents and charging yeah. non-residents? Yeah, I say... Or do you, do you just charge or not charge and you have but to It's, just, it's something to think about. It's for yeah. income because there is an uptick in, um, in that. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to the board about was um, with this upcoming election year. With the trouble that uh, we had with the last presidential election, the... Um, it's called HABA. That's the site that we're all on to enter all of our information for elections. And there's a, a great deal that has to be entered, whether it's absentee ballots or timing. And so they have now changed our passwords to a 25-letter password that expires in 20 minutes. And when we sign on our 25 letters, they text us to our phone a code that we have to enter. So picture me at my desk, and I've got a stack of, whether it's absentee ballots or, you know, new residents applying. So I, I get key, I, I finally get in, and then I get someone at my window, and the 20 minutes is up, and then I'm back, and i got to do it again. So 
that's why a lot of the times I come in after hours or before hours because I, I can't do it. It's too frustrating and the room for era is... But why can't Andrea cover the window when you're doing something that is that sensitive? She can. Oh, she can. But it's not always that she's not doing anything. I mean, she's got a lot going on, too. I mean, she... I, I think people have the perception that tax time is two times a year, and that's it. But there's tax lien, there's deeding, it, it, there's a whole year that it follows through. Um, which is the other reason that I brought this calendar, is I wanted to show you that these are the calendars we get from the state when we're about to have the massive elections that we're going to have. And every time that you see this lettering in black, that's a requirement of the town. Something that we have to do, some kind of meeting we have to have, and you can see that it's full every single month. And then it drops into um, July, August, and September, which is why so many clerks free up their time, because then it's blank. That's when, that's the only time we have where we're not committed to be here. And the new calendar is coming out, and I'll share it with you, because I just don't think people realize it's like two separate jobs. It's like your election and what you do at the window. And, um, and it's getting, as the password indicates, it's getting more and more strict, and it should, I mean, and uh, so, anyways, our, I did do our um, figures for autos, and we are up, um, I thought I did, I am almost to where we have budgeted me, and this is, that was through July, so the autos are coming in, they're, they're just, it's great. I think it's wonderful for the town, but there's a lot, and it definitely constitutes, I think, having two systems running, you know, when necessary. So we might be able to not have a second computer, another computer, just run it off. Right. Okay, but we're right. waiting for an answer. Right? Yeah, and I had said to Caroline, maybe we could take my printer, which is limping, as a second one for when Andrea drops in, and then I would get the new one. And Caroline suggested, and I asked, whether we can both use that computer, but that gets kind of concluded. If I'm doing a title app, and she's doing a registration, then we got to get through the paperwork to see who's is what. I mean, it would be easier if she had the older one, kind of went through with that, and I did get a new one. But we'll take it one step at a time. I don't know. I reached out to the state and gotten back to me on how we can do it. But I'm just trying to be efficient. You know, I had a kid that waited maybe 15 minutes today in line. And then when he got up, you know, I brought up his registration. And his registration privileges had been revoked. So we waited for nothing. I waited for about eight minutes and then I left. Yeah. yeah. See? So, <laughs> I think it was behind him. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's hilarious. You know, it used to be, I used to be, you know it like clockwork. Beginning of the month, end of the month, you know, Thursday nights. Mid-Thursday, a week ago, I was slammed. This past Thursday, average. There, there's no, I can't, you can't put a pulse on it. But the money's coming in, and um, you're going to see the DMV pushing more to the towns. Yeah, I know. It's, I mean, we're doing a lot now, but I think we're going to start doing titles, which was something that we would mail out and they would reprocess titles. I think they're going to produce, they're going to supply us with the paper and we're going to be doing the titles. Um, it's just, and, and then the state with the um, elections, it's, it's a full-time job. So, that's my budget, and I'm glad that you had a chance. It's not too busy that you could listen to my woes. I wonder if it was busier last Thursday, like if there's a, uh, you know, bi-weekly pay periods or something. Like next, maybe next Thursday it'll be busy again. No, because, well, we generally, the last, the last Thursday night and the first are our busiest. Because people either, if they come in in the first, they would, they would do last month, mm -hmm. or they come in 
towards the end. Because they're due. Yeah. And then I have months, like September people, I sent them out, I've already sent September out, half of them are already done. I, I swear it's like the, what is the um, zodiac signs? <laughs> you have people that are like ahead, and that's how it falls. It's just, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Have you modified, have you thought about modification of your schedule of having two nights? I have. Carol and I talked about it today, and I'm open to it. I mean, I, I don't mind. I love having the days off. Mm -hmm. If I did Tuesday, Thursday, I, I'd like to think it would be busier, but I think people get paid Thursday, Friday, and that's where... People come so many well, you on could do Thursday a, nights. You could do a trial run and see what Tuesday Thursday did. We I could. mean, you could put it, you know, put it out there that we're going to try to, you know, have yeah. a second night and see right. how it works. Right. Um, and if it if it doesn't work, then that doesn't make sense. Right. You I could do try to flip flop my hours. No, I understand that, that and I don't like that either. People. I, 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 I don't. Do a poll. You could, like but I will say office. another yeah. thing. Yeah. That I've noticed, um, I, I would say some Thursday nights more than fifty percent are retired people, which I just don't. Which get. surprises me because I, don't I would get think it. that you would have more of the working force exactly. that's there because they can't come during exactly. the day. Exactly, and all these people can come the other days of the week when they come on a Thursday night. Mm -hmm. So it's customer. You know, it's I've said for years: you damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm -hmm. There's no, and we've done everything. So that you can do it either online or by phone or or by mail. Um, the only thing you can't do is when you do a brand new vehicle, you have to come in. Mm -hmm. And for most people, that's not that often. Yeah. And um, I would like to go back to um, getting the Dropbox. So that it's been ordered. Yeah. Oh, good. So that when somebody shows up and they're like. I just missed them by 20 minutes. They can just put it in and process it and send it out. A lot of people's mentality, I'm not going to go to the post office and get a 50 cent stamp to mail it across the street. Mm. Which makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I would stick it out on my box, but I just can't get, I mean, it's been five years I've been doing the mail and renewals. It's better. There are more people using it, but the majority of them carry it in. So, uh, I, you know, <laughs> I'd love to go online. Portsmouth went online and then they took it out because it was a $3 charge per transaction. So if you have a car, motorcycle, and a trailer, it's $9 more. They would process it and people would say, well, wait a minute. Oh, well, I, don't, I don't pay $9 more. And with the DMV, when you process it, it's done. There's no backing out. There are charges too. But you yeah. may charge them. Do yeah. you register a vehicle in mine? Yeah. If you don't want to wait in mine, it's only three bucks in my <laughs> It is. But do you realize it's per transaction? That's what catches people. And the system doesn't let you back out once you get in, right? Right. So once you've processed it, you're done. Yeah. But it, it's City of Dover, because I do have the work vehicles. Yeah. Um, it's very clear that this is the fees yeah. before you get down to the no return and getting out, you know. Which I understand on the mail and renewal, but when they come to the window and you've processed it, that's when they have the question. I don't sorry, know why, I don't why do they you. come in as well they should be coming paying in by the door. Yes. Come in and yes. Oh, oh, oh. So if they're at home and they're packing it in, it gives them their total and at that point it's their choice mm -hmm. to do it or not. Mm -hmm. If they come in with a debit card and I process it, then it's done. And then they put their card in and they're like, well, wait, why is it $3 more? And I say, you know, if you don't pay by check or cash, oh, it's $3 more. Oh, I don't want to do it then. So oh, I need to I don't take credit card, debit cards. You take debit cards here? No, no we don't. I'm saying. Oh, if you, if you did do it. If I did do it. Oh, okay. And the picture gets bigger, too. Like, wouldn't it be great if we could do it in mail-ins, right? But then... If you could just do it mail-in, it's great. But then people come to your window and they're like, well, I can use a debit card or mail-in, why can't I use it here? And if I can use a debit card for you, why can't I do them for my taxes? Which, again, 3% of a $3,000 tax bill, people aren't going to do. Yeah. I, I just, I wish, I wish it was this easy, easy system, but... What about a system 
um, where I, I don't know the legality of it, but if uh, like on the town website, if there was a form that you built that said exactly what you needed to, like say someone comes to the window, I'm sure there's certain things they need to provide, numbers, um, whatever, identification their car, mm -hmm. but they fill it out online and then you could input it into the state system later or upload it to the state system later, be free, mm -hmm. except for your time. I'll follow you. So like, uh, like you would have an axe, like a database behind, so then it would, uh, you would, so they could go to the website, mm -hmm. they could say, okay, I want to register a car, and it would be a form that you built, or someone built, and they would, they would ask them, what's your name, what's your car number, what's this, That's... and then upload, it would go to pass to you, or someone in the office, and then you could either upload it to the, the state, if the state has some sort of ability to, to receive that by XML or CSV or something. They do. They do. And that's the program I was talking about. There is one through Avatar, and I think it was 10 or better. And there's one through, it's called Easy Reg, which I have the dog program. So it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those programs where you build on it, and people would be able to do their dogs online, mm -hmm. and they could do their cars online. But again, then we're taking credit cards online, but not at the window. Because they still have to pay for the registration. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, like I said, I can barely get people to spend the 50 cents to mail again. I, I, I don't see a lot of them spending the three. One transaction? Yeah. But most people have, I mean, I think every house in town has three cars, a trailer, a motorcycle, and a boat. This thing. <laughs> And two dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and two dogs. I'm going to open a dog no. park in my neighborhood. So, that would anyways. Well. <laughs> I, um, I'm trying to each year make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, I would pay $10 to do something online. So would I. I would I pay know. $50 not to go to the post office and buy a stamp. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> but if you were not the average. Now, eventually, as our generation changes in town, I can see that. But right now, I say, wait in line. I spent ten dollars to send a certified letter online the other day. You didn't do that? No. It's fantastic. The future is here. Well, see, that, it, it, I get it. I get it. And I'm right in between the two. So, like, I get what the younger kids are doing. It's so much easier. My kids can't believe I don't have Vimo or whatever it is. And, <laughs> and then, um, but then I have, like, my in-laws that, you know, there's no way they put the stamp on it. You know, so that's where we're at. You can't please everybody. All right, I just have a, um, a question on your um, request to increase your hours to 23 a week. Is it every single week that you have three extra hours? What's like in the summertime, um, so if I don't come in at 8.30, so if I come in at 9 o'clock, okay, then my system's not up, my cash register's not out, I'm not really ready for business. I can't get to my emails and my phone messages. Now, every day is different. Today, I don't think I got to my desk till 11, 12 o'clock. So I try to come in, answer my emails, answer my phone messages, set up my station. So, it, it, you know, it takes a half an hour. Yeah, maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes. Um, Thursday night last week, I went over to the bank in Summersworth. You know, by the time I got home, it's 7.25. So I always did this, and I've been doing it for years. But I'm, I'm just at the point where I really I can't mask it. I should get paid for the hours that I work. Now this is our slowest period right now. You will see when I present my timesheets going forward that 23 is a, the, a minimum, the, probably the least. What is your maximum, approximately? Um, 25 is probably more accurate through like auditing, um, town reports, uh, town meeting. If you get into elections, it's probably 30, 35. I mean, I wish I had an easy calculation. The only thing I can do is keep track of it for a year for you. Because I've done it, 
and uh, until um, Suzanne suggested that I keep track of it, and I did, and I was actually quite surprised myself how many hours. And I get it. It's salary. And I try to offset it. Well, let's uh, talk about that. What are your feelings of versus salary versus hourly? I would... I think you lose a lot of control if you go hourly. Do we even have the so. option to do that? She I mean, used to be she used hourly. To be hourly. I don't I know why they made her a salary. It. Oh, Beverly did? No, you used to be hourly. What? You changed to salary about three years ago after the, um, like the election stipend committee um, met and evaluated, and then you. Um, at some point after that, the board gave you some kind of market increase because you did not receive the across-the-board increases that other employees got for two or three years in a row. And so they did that for you retroactively. Um, and it coincided approximately with the time of that subcommittee, and they made you salary at the same time. I think that was in 15. 15 or 16. That's interesting. And we'll have to look back at um, the payroll because I never remember my check ever fluctuating. It doesn't mean it fluctuated. Oh, well, because you could have just worked the amount of hours that you would have worked on the salary. Oh. Or hourly. Right. Like four because hours a day, five days a week, and that was it. Stamps, so. But you did do a, you did do a, you did do a timesheet for, for quite a while until um, the select board, after one audit period, um, Suzanne in particular took issue with elected officials signing the timesheet of another elected official and they just oh. didn't see the point in that and the audit agreed and auditor agreed and so then you were no longer required to do timesheets. I don't remember that. Okay, but now that we have a business administrator, a town administrator, yeah. we would be able to have that conflict gone. What conflict was that? What? A town official elected town official signing a town official elected signature. Well, so if you're suggesting that I sign her timesheet, I certainly can, but it, it kind of doesn't, it's really just an acknowledgement of her self-reported hours because as an elected official, um, I mean, it depends. If, you're, if, if she's salary, then it doesn't... That's not what I'm... I'm just looking at if... She's looking for 23 hours a week, Versus, but if you're not working 23 hours a week every week, right. then we're going to be paying a salary that we're not getting the benefit from right. the town. True. And if you so making her hourly, she will get what she's what she works. So okay, it doesn't. So you certainly could have me sign timesheets. It doesn't mean that the board can't sign timesheets. The auditor just um, agreed with the idea elected officials over elected officials. But but if that's the new arrangement and she's agreeing to that, we can check with him. But I don't think that's necessarily a conflict. It wasn't done away with because the auditor felt it was a conflict or agreed that it was a conflict. But more more than that, just sort of validated the board's concern about it being a conflict. And I'm not for the yeah. card. I think we're, we're those are, here. I'm fine with that. I just well, I just think that, you know, there are, debt there are times when you work more hours and yes. there are times when you don't. Right. And so in order to get paid what you believe that you are working, right. then in fairness, I think hourly would be right the right have to go. Right. Um, but just think about it. Yeah. No, I will. And I um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to take Fridays next year because the election in September is going to involve um, time in July, August, and September. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, you know, I have taken, the first couple of years, Fridays were dead as doornails. And then I've taken them off, but then I find that I'm so much busier on Thursday night and Monday, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, you know, they're all coming on the four days instead of the five. And with the election, I just don't know all of them, but it's going to pan out. But, so, and I do try to do everything based on what's best for residents. Mm -hmm. 
So when you were taking the Fridays off, that was compensating you for the time that you were working over your 20, is what you had explained to me. Yes. That, so if yes. you got paid for your 20 right. something plus hours, then, right. then you wouldn't get paid for I it if you took a Friday. as much. Right, right, right. Right, it would just be my average, like everybody gets, you know, three, four weeks, whatever it is at this point in my tenure, however many you get. An elected Weeks. official? Yes. You don't, no, yes. I'm saying, I know. See, um, I'm so stuck in the middle. Like, I, I'm so yes. used to everywhere I've ever worked, I have a timesheet. And this is how much vacation time you had, this is what you, you know, and you knew what you had. But I am, you know, extremely honest about the way that I track it. And even my quiet time right now, I'm still four and a half hours on days. As, you know, I'm submitting my timesheets that you can see. Um, just so that I'm prepared when the window opens, mm -hmm. and then when you close, I could do my reports, do my deposits, and um, so the hours are there. I just, okay. I just am hoping that you realize how busy our little community is getting. Any other questions? No. Questions? All right. Thanks so much, Kate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. For the Oh, you're welcome. Are those for your tree? Oh, yeah. oh, ours are tiny, tiny. Ours are dropping off. I don't even know what I'm going to do with them all. I keep bringing them. Yeah. You, it's easier said than done when you peel about 200 of them. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. Chief?
so it doesn't you know crawl up their ankles or up their wrists like that, so that they get rid of those burn fats. And when they do that, all that measurement is presumably when it's issued to our guy that has his name inside the coat. So if I order something for Knowles, mm -hmm. it comes in with Knowles on the inside, or as long as he's there, mm -hmm. and then when the next guy comes, we kind of scratch that off and put somebody else's in there. The name isn't so much the kicker, it's the actual manufacturer date. Mm -hmm. Month and year. So if we buy something right now and it's uh, what, 8 of 19? Mm -hmm. Come 8 of 29, bye bye. You really can't be using it. Well, what about, because sometimes you have some turnover and it goes into storage. Goes so does it up. count on the storage time or is it usage years? It's, it's the usage years. So what happens when we get something that's beyond 10 years? Mm -hmm. We don't, obviously, we don't get rid of it, mm -hmm. it goes upstairs. Mm -hmm. It's there for if we have other members that come in and are going to be trained and they're not going to school quite yet, we give them that gear. It's still serviceable. There's nothing wrong with this stuff. Some of it, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's still good gear. Yeah. You know, it's fine. This stuff will last 30 years. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is, NFPA has that time stamp that's been approved after you have to go by. But we have that extra gear upstairs. If somebody's gear gets dirty or damaged and, you know, we had all the fires last week, so guys are washing the gear, they don't have a backup set. We pull that stuff down so they're able to respond again. Well, they're getting clean and whatnot. So that's in the house, but if they're at the academy, you can't do that. Okay, I got it. What happens if there's an injury on the gear past ten years? That's what you don't want. That's why you've got to make sure that these folks are staying within that ten-year time frame. I'll be honest, my gear's got like twenty-two years old. Mm -hmm. I don't replace it. I'll just come out and say that. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a building as much. I mean, I am from time to time. But in, in balancing all these, all the budget and whatnot, the members are more important than, than my, you know, I shouldn't say it that way, that's the way I feel. I mean, I should have a coat, because there's no doubt about it. I'm way past the date. But no, those guys are doing it a day. And they're in the building more than I am. So I'm making sure they have their stuff. If I go in and I got hurt, it would be an issue. 23. Anybody that's outside of date, the liability issue is what crops up. Right. So that's what we're trying to stay ahead of by uh, that line item. It's getting more and more difficult to do it. And you talk about the turnover. It's all time. Mm -hmm. I know. That's what I'm saying. How does that, with the clock, how does that work? Because it can be. But you would use it in how, and the liability of the gear. It would have to be proven that it was an injury based on gear and not based on something sure. else. So, I mean, yeah. you're not putting people out there in the, those black coats that they had 20 years ago. No, <laughs> you know? rubber boots yeah. and those kind of things. So, I mean... Those days are gone. Yeah. what happens, uh, I'll use an example. The Berwick incident with Captain Barnes, once you know something like that happens, all that stuff is confiscated. Mm -hmm. Everything that he had on him from his air pack to every bit of his gear to his radio to everything. Mm -hmm. And it's all salted away for the investigation purposes. So they make sure that there's no loopholes or something that was totally wrong mm -hmm. that may have led to the incident. Gear is a, is a major part of it. Sure. In his case, all his stuff was fine. Even if you had somebody in there, but we don't ever get anybody gear that's not serviceable. By that I mean there's no rips, there's no tears. Other than that little date stamp, mm -hmm. the gear is all 100% fine. You know, I will not let anybody wear something that's just not, not serviceable when it gets to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do service checks and gear checks bi-monthly. So the guys pull the gear out, we go through it, make sure dates are all set, make sure everything's ready to go, so nothing slips by. Um, but, uh, normally right now, the way our system is set up, the amount of people that we have, we have uh, 18 sets of gear which are in date. And we have 24 guys. You know, there's 24 guys, there's eight of us that show up on a regular area. So those are the guys that are, like I said, who's getting the good stuff, the new stuff that's active, that we can count on to be there, than the guy that shows up just a handful of times. That's just the nature of our business right now, the way we're set up. Any questions on the gear line? Again, I'm trying to balance. Um, I could ask for a heck of a more, but I'm trying to keep it within the reasonable requests. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, three uh, is the computer line. We wanted to add a little bit to that because uh, we're looking down the road two things. And I, I kind of talked to Caroline. You're talking about maybe a group thing at the town we eventually do, and that may help us because we need to upgrade one. 
But the other thing that we're looking at trying to do is uh, looking at getting an iPad kind of system that we can keep either one of the engines or the command vehicle so that we can download all the stuff that we have in the station computer as you know streets, hydrants, buildings and their protection systems, all that kind of stuff so we can just have it on an iPad, punch up where we're going, we're going to the middle, okay, punch it up, it'll tell us where our hydrants are, it'll tell us where the standpipes are, it'll tell us where the fire department connections are, all that stuff at two in the morning you may be a little foggy to try to remember. So we're looking down the road to try to get that in. And the program that we have now, our emergency reporting software, offers that ability to be able to get one of these iPads and download our stuff right into that. So that's what we're looking for. We're not going to do it right away because we're still, you know, correlating off a lot of our equipment. But we're looking to get to that to that point. Now, are you, does he work with Tom for the computer? They we certainly get could, better, but they have right? like they have lots of techie people in the in house. But you, you should yeah. take that point though. That Tom yeah, Bell yeah. has. Yeah. Um, yeah. Contracts and vendors with people that can sometimes okay. offer less expensive. All right, that's a good idea. We can follow up when we get to a, that point. You know, yeah. a better computer for yeah. less money. But I also get you know the same thing with Sean Lynn. That's what he does for a living. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Are you thinking like one iPad or like a couple of refurbished ones? Uh, it could be either, but probably just one. We'll either keep it. You know, those two pieces are going out. I recall, mm -hmm. so it's going to be there and be available. It'll be one of those one hundred percent of the time. I think with Sean, that's his job. He designs the systems for major companies, so he's uh, he's kind of like a go-to guy. But I understand the problem well, and we've used him before. He's been in the station before. Kevin's still there and some stuff for us. So, but it's it's I particularly handy for purchases because yeah. there can be government discounts sometimes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we actually do create some revenue for the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if people call and ask us for a fire report, mm -hmm. um, we charge 25 bucks for a mm -hmm. fire. No, excuse me. For an incident report, an incident run sheet, mm -hmm. it's $25. Mm -hmm. If they want a fire report, we've been charging $50. Just because there's a lot more paperwork involved with the actual fire incident. And we had another, we've been sitting down at the station and talking about setting up a fee schedule for some of the other permits that people are coming in for. And we, we could go as far as, you know, whether it wants to be a, a burning permit, uh, installation of like uh, oil burners or chimney inspections. Mm -hmm. I mean, all that stuff, most fire departments have some sort of fee schedule for that. So we were kind of looking, well, if we do a fair amount of those, why should not we do some of that stuff? I think last month, you know, Caroline, a couple of different checks that have come to us from, uh, we're getting more and more and more requests from insurance companies and lawyers. Just about every call, it, half the calls we go to are going to generate some kind of paperwork for an outside agency. Mm -hmm. it, it's all the time. So, um, again, that's where this is coming from, because we're just generating more stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, you, don't, you don't charge your state and federal reports. No. You don't charge. It's just your, your local ones that... Yep, outside local. agencies yep. are calling us for different requests. And, um, you know, we become more and more school with that with our personnel as far as their report writing skills and their entry skills as far as putting things into the computer because we're trying to elaborate on a lot more stuff mm -hmm. so that uh, not only to get the information that these agencies are requesting but also to get all our information because we get requests that are a year or 18 months old mm -hmm. and we're trying to remember, geez, what the call was that one? Mm -hmm. So they go back in and refresh our memories but also to make sure that they get the information they want. So we're expanding our knowledge base on what we're able to regurgitate in those reports. So uh, everybody's happy with it. Instead so, of these little one-line items, you know, we went here and did this and this, we're all done. No. Mm -hmm. Expand on mm -hmm. that. Everything that you did, everybody that was there. So that's where all this is coming from. Where does this revenue show? Is it all lumped up? It's brand new. It's in um, other miscellaneous revenue for now. Okay. If it, if it continues to pick up, I would create its own line. Um, and I might create its own line anyway because it would be interesting to track. Yeah, but it also help justify the fact that he needs more supplies because he has to do these reports which he's getting revenue in, so it helps offset his so-called budget in, in some fashion. You know, that at least he's bringing... Okay. Well, I'm just, I'm just thinking about it, that's all. But if he's, if he's bringing in money and he needs a case of paper because he's making all these reports, then it kind of helps justify it. Yeah. Yes. I know what I do and you really we're getting close to offset that number. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Where are you going with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay? Any other questions so far? No? Good. Okay, we'll go back to number one. Because I know it's going to generate most of the conversation. And I want to kind of expand on it a little bit. The same request, and as I've written in there, kind of a little bit of a background on why the request is there. I think everybody understands that I've kind of been in here numerous times and kind of said where we need to go. And I'll continue to say it, that this town is the biggest bang for its buck of anything in the area because of what we're able to do. And I think some of it is because um, we've developed a pattern from the past, from Harry on down, the fact that the community always had some people that were firefighters someplace else, shift work someplace else, so people were always around. Mm -hmm. Those days are dwindled down to practically nothing. This morning we had a fire call, a trash truck on fire right out here on Main Street, and had two members show up. Daytime call, 8 to 4. That's where a lot of this is coming from. That's our biggest problem is trying to get enough money for that 8 to 4 slot. Kevin was always around, uh, that's gone. Uh, I was left where I was working, I was working down in Kittery and started this way because that's what I do on most every call. Uh, but everybody else is working, so that two person response is, is uh, very limited in what we can do, safety wise. So, building on that is. I've done some little bit of calculations and some thinking and some discussion with some of the other chiefs. And I know it's coming and I've discussed it that that's getting very, very close. And I don't know how many people get the Fosters and Red Sundays that Greenland just put on permanent firefighters for the first time. We hired two full time guys. And I've said it before and I'll say it again we don't need full time guys because our call volume isn't that way, but you can't just relate it to call volume. Because if we had people that were here more often, that could encompass public education, 
building inspections, uh, boilers, burners, truck maintenance, station maintenance, all that stuff could come underneath the people were here. But what I'm thinking, and I'm not advocating it now, but it's like right on the, around the corner, is I'd like to see, we'll make a proposal someplace here in the very near future, that we do some sort of per diem type of coverage for our community. NFPA standard says that you should be, uh, when an alarm is received, in three to five minutes, you should be on your fire truck and headed out the door. If we make that half the time, we're lucky. And I think some of that's only because it's me and Sean or me and Danny Tuff or somebody that live like right next to the firehouse. Harry was the exact same way. Um, but what I was thinking down the road is there's a lot of smaller communities now that don't want full-time guys to have to do, have to do what they call per diem. So they'll have an open shift because they do have full-time positions. And they'll hire guys whether it's 8, 10, 12, or 24 hours. Our biggest issue is that 8 to 4 slot during the daytime. Where so every time a page comes in, you know, my, meet, my blood pressure immediately goes up here. Because I don't know who's coming. I have no guarantee that I'll even have anybody. Okay? And that's just something that liability-wise may come back to become an issue with us down the road if we can't respond to something within that time and manner. We all know as far as the officers goes and some of our senior people, and we are very, very lucky that we have this kind of relationship with South Berwick because this morning their Chief Joe Rousseau comes over and we can probably call them, but we cannot rely on them to be the initial responder. We cannot do that. Um, that will come back to really become an issue because they'd be augmenting another community on their tax dollars and that just won't go very far. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about, where I'm thinking of going is uh, eventually kind of my thoughts were have two guys that would make themselves available in that eight to four time slot Monday to Friday and pay them a stipend of 50 bucks a day. 100 bucks a day, two guys. Sat down and figured it out, it's like $36,000. But you're guaranteed you would have two guys, fire station, five minutes or so to be able to get something on the door. To at least start what we need to do to mitigate whatever the problem's going to be. That's where I'm leading to. That's my first step. That's my first thought on how to help solve our staffing issues. It's coming. See, because I, when I'm local, it's not a big deal, because I'm coming, I'm where am I at? I don't know what the call is, I'm coming anyway. Uh, so I leave my paying job to come to my partial uh, job. So, um, but we just don't have folks anymore. Sean is around the watch, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But he travels, you know, and when he travels, he's in Atlanta, he's in Vegas, he's in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he's, you know, I can be there now or not. I'm always coming. One of around. Danny Tuff does shift work. So it's two days a week anyway that he's out. Dave has been very good lately only because his two days I know his schedule. So we've been feeding off these guys that do shift work that are able to fill in these gaps. But that's getting fewer and fewer reliable. So my thought is down the road. Now this, this is kind of just discussion here right now. I've started to work some numbers and some thinking so that the community as a whole and you guys right here can start thinking about it. That is probably the best way to start to alleviate the problem. I don't have a key for full-time guys because we're not there. Will we be there? Maybe. But that cost is, I don't even want to see those numbers. So that's my thought. And I put the five in there again, as I said here, to try to maintain and get us up a little bit over that minimum wage threshold. And right now I think the state is still 725, even though yeah, I saw something the other day and I read it and I look at it, that the state's pushing to get up to 10. And it was on the governor's desk a month or so ago. Where it stands right now, I'm not sure. But I do know right there, I put down one of those fire departments, start their intro people at, at the 14 level, and that's on the very low end of the scale. And I'm not looking for that either, but I'm looking for something where these guys will have a reason to want to be around. Um, some of these guys, you know, need a little bit that they get on their quarterly uh, payroll status, but 
and it's getting harder and harder to keep people. Harder and harder and harder. And they keep them active. That's our issue. We're a training ground. That's nothing more than we are. We grab them, we train them, and off they go. Yeah. And eventually, that is the kind of reverse to maybe you'll have. Other than the town folk that live in town, that manage to be a fire department, we can always run on that, but even that starts to change. But they can come back. It's funny how they circle around, isn't it? Yeah, they're gone, and when they're retired, they come back, which is really good. Because yeah. they remembered where they got trained. They remembered where they come from. Right. I say that an awful lot. But yeah. yeah. I got a new member of the station tonight. We had. Uh, we had five people that were sitting through the EMT class that were over at UNH. Uh, all five of them passed. So now they have to go through their national registry to become certified EMTs. One of the uh, other students in the class got kind of close to some of the Rollins from members that were there, John Cunningham. I don't know if you know John Cunningham. He's one of the instructors and sitting in our station right now, filled out an application because he'd like to make a transition into the fire service. So this is another one of the hundreds that have come through that I've been associated with. We'll give you a start, we'll get you going. It's the same thing when I come in and tell you about our training and we'll get certified. And if we keep them for a year or two, we're doing well. Comes another one down the road. Mm -hmm. So that's where all this is coming from. Am I, am I making sense? It's not that I just want, none of us want to be looking at it. It's a good jump and but it's something that has to come to the forefront and that the community has to start making some decisions on on how they want to staff their fire department. Because the days of what we've been doing are dwindling as people are getting older and experience level isn't there and life changes happen and, and they move on. So, as of this point, I put the five in there just to kind of keep us building up. Warranted, or we can go with what I've requested for now. I just want to clarify for the board that his $5,000 request on salaries is in addition to the $5,000 that you've allocated to his budget this year that was not part of the <coughs> official town budget. Mm -hmm. right. So it appears in the official budget worksheet as a $10,000 increase. Oh, because it's not showing there. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. I had that question for her the other day. Yep. Yeah. So, because I thought that you had, that I had been informed that that was something that you guys had put back in. Mm -hmm. But because of the way it all lays out, it doesn't show that. So mm -hmm. I'm operating under the increase that you guys added to it. Yeah. Um, this might be something that everybody knows that I don't. Um, new people coming in and we're paying for training, does that get paid back? Or is it possible to come and get training and then go off and get a job somewhere else? That's usually what happens. And what we do is we have a sheet. We have a, a contract that we have them sign. Mm -hmm. And we want them to stay there for a minimum of one year to help get some of that back. But we are not paying the, uh, the whole price of the training. If they go to a training class, um, I have a gentleman right now that's in the academy taking the uh, recruit school to the fire academy. It's a $7,000 tuition fee. Because he's affiliated with the fire department, us, it's $1,700. Mm -hmm. Out of that $1,700, we'll pay half. He's responsible for the other half. Right. And uh, I'm very upfront with that stuff. They know what they have to do as far as their training. Because the certification stuff that you require to do to be a firefighter is immense. Mm -hmm. And you have to have it or we can't use you. My father went to the academy when I was a kid, so... Father uh, was a firefighter? Yeah, in Barnstown, he was a volunteer firefighter. Okay. So, you understand some, of what, some, of, what, of, time. some of what we're going on. Yeah. And these guys give immense amount of time. You know, it doesn't reflect on what these guys all do to, to make everything work in, in our little situation here. So, uh, but that's, again, that's another thing that we can try to get some folks here. Because we're battling every other fire department in the area for trying to get personnel. Go by Elliott's fire station any day and you look at their door on one of their bays and what does it say? Firefighters needed now. Big letters. They added the now we could do that. <laughs> but they always had the firefighter needed part up there. So we're constantly, constantly trying to draw from other people. 
you know, not to beat my own drum, but because of some of the connections I had, an awful lot of people that are looking to get into this business, they send them our way for a lot of different reasons. But the fire department has a very good reputation about being able to get these people, get them trained, get them skilled, teach them the right way. And they know, I have so many chiefs that, you got anybody over there? Some of these full-time chiefs, because they want to pluck people out of our mm -hmm. fire department. And I've said to you time and time again, I have a list in my desk drawer that has 68 names from guys that are come in, train, and work with us, and are not permanent someplace else. Yeah. 68 guys. It's so permanent or, or in full-time? Career, mm -hmm. career permanent people that have gone through our fire department. So. I well, use that. I use, I use that. Oh, Dover. 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 But I use that as a tool for recruitment and retention because of those reasons. Mm -hmm. And so the people that I've worked with over the years know the chiefs understand that. So we kind of we're a training ground, like I, like I said earlier. And we know that, and it's just the way it is. We try to hold on to them as long as we can. Mm -hmm. And as you said, some of them circle the way back. Are there other programs? So the academy, if you go and you're affiliated, you get a discount. Yep. Are there other programs that we could leverage for retention? Like, you know, okay, yeah, eventually they're going to get trained up to a certain point and peace out. But if there's programs that's going to cost us $600 over a year and it keeps them in our system for a year, mm -hmm. yeah, they're going to be much more attractive to another town, but it might keep them here working for it. Is there anything like that or? Well, I kind of know where you're going. The fact is it's more, it's more, it becomes a, there's no system or a program like that. It becomes more of a loyalty thing and understanding where your roots are. Oh, so there's yeah. no like level two or level three or is that more like EMT side? Oh no, there's, there's firefighter level yeah. one. It used to be firefighter level one, career two and three. Mm -hmm. That's what I went through 30 years ago. Nowadays it's level one, level two. Um, one gentleman we have now is in Rye, he's going to come out as a level one. The new guy we'll probably put on here in the next week and we'll probably start in fall with Larry Straffin's classes that he runs in North Burke. He gets out as a level two. There's more bang for the buck there mm -hmm. because he's getting both certifications. Um, and in the old days when you had a level three certification, that included things that were uh, above and beyond the normal firefighting skill. It would be like uh, Repelling, below grade rescue, building collapse, trench rescue, water rescue, water rescue, swift water rescue. So these are all under certain grades. These are not like pick and choose. No, okay, no. So. Um, they used to be on the old level three. You had to go take all those to get level three. So what happens now is you get your level one, which is all your basic basic stuff. You get to level two, which now includes things like auto extrication and, and rope work and, and, and some of the advanced skills. Level three went away, and now you go to a class and you get a specific certification in. Swift water rescue, ice water rescue, low grade rescue, trench rescue. Instead of encompassing in one class, you get one specific certificate because you spent two or three weeks in one specific class. Oh, so they're very short. They're short. short. Courses. They are yeah. short, but they're very, very specific and timely. You know what the biggest one is now? It's bombs and active shooting. Mm -hmm. Those are everywhere. If I want to send one of our members to any one of those if they want to go, Federal government picks up the tab and off they go. That's the big one. Sad, but that's, mm -hmm. that's where the money is right now. It's all in that stuff. So we see that stuff, and, and we have a couple of guys that uh, have shown interest, and in, you know they want to go do it. Is it going to cost us anything? But we recoup the certification. So should they come back? You know, I talked to Police Juicer about that. He loves that stuff. He makes it nice to go. That's great. Guys. It just doesn't have manpower either. If you just mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so it's. It's just constantly recycling and regurgitating itself. So we try to keep up as best we can. We can't make them sign any contracts on that because we don't have to pay anything for it. That's the hard part. So if we're giving you something, so you man up and sign this piece of paper and right. give us a little something back. This is really where a lot of it goes. It's a new new um, veto the minimum wage, by the way. What's that? It's a new new veto the minimum wage. Okay, thank you. <laughs> It was 10 bucks, I think, sitting on his Yeah, bed. 10 bucks now, 12 bucks in a couple of years. There it was. Yeah. All right, that's fine. So we'll still circle the 725, <laughs> but I know that's, uh, that's constantly getting up. Yeah, it, it'll happen eventually. Well, it's the thing with me is, again, and I said, let's have the same conversation. It's extremely difficult to see my members working next to somebody else, you know, making six or seven dollars, and these guys are making 20, 25, 35 dollars. Exact same work, exact same certification. 
this guy's in Dover, this guy's in Ralston. They're both the same, except in some of those other places. They don't, just because you work in all sort of call department or volunteer fire department, department, your standard is no different than the guy that works in Manchester, Boston, or St. Louis. It's exactly the same. That's what's so, that's what is so difficult for us to try to maintain what we've got. Really, really hard. We hang in there, though. We're doing okay. That much I can tell you. We're doing okay. Just because we have a very well dedicated bunch of guys that show up at the firehouse. So, that's my pitch. Any other questions? No. I'm good, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank okay. you. $200,000 ballpark 
a little bit less, in one case a little bit more. And one of the, um, what we try to do is to keep the annual appropriation request as flat as possible. Uh, but nonetheless, if you look at the executive summary, there's a real, you know, it's slowly increasing across the 10 years until you get to the 2029, and it's, ooh, a little high. So we'll talk about that in a bit, but that, that is the case with this CIP. And, uh, but otherwise, other than that last year, we're, we're trying to keep the request as flat as possible as a recommendation. The other um, difference that you'll see is that the, <clears throat> the item that has been called town administration slash police facility has been changed to town hall slash RPD system upgrades. And can you explain why? Yes. So um, we know that the board and the town have not made a decision about the facility, facility for either town administration or the RPD, whether it stays, whether it's a new building. So that line was was never enough money, but it was we had put it in it. We put that line in there to cover a new facility. So so if if so you have to, you know, that we're, we're playing with an ambiguity. Is there going to be a new facility? Is there not going to be a new facility? If there's a new facility, that amount doesn't cover it in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we just said, okay, we'll call it system upgrades. And if, to this building. And should the board and the town agree to, to bond a new building, then that line is no longer used for system upgrades for this building. It can be, you know, the, the board could take it, stick it in the operating budget, and help defray the principal and interest payments on bond. Okay, but you're assuming that we are only still going to have one building versus maybe two buildings. We're, we're thinking through ambiguity, right? There's no, there's no decision one way or the other. And so what we've done is say, oh, okay, we've got, we, you know, we've got this building. This is what we currently have. And so mm -hmm. let's think about changing that line to say improvements and upgrades to this particular building. So if, if, if it's just, it's a name change, right? So the non But it's change. also a meaning change. It's, it, it's changing the whole meaning of what it, in, it was originally intended for, in my opinion. Because it's now upgrades versus new facility. And we don't know what it is, and you're absolutely right. But until we knew what it's going to be, my opinion is that it shouldn't have changed the, the intent of what it was originally. This is, the, this is the CIP committee's recommendation. You are the board, and you can do whatever you would like mm -hmm. from this point on. Mm -hmm. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is tell you the context and the rationale for why we made the changes we made. So the board is going to do what the board does, and that's fine. So, but given that, that is how we thought it through. And there is in the plan $284,000 dedicated to specific town hall projects. And these were all there before. These are not new, although we may make slight adjustments to the project costs. The generator replacement, security upgrade, replacement of the facility, air conditioning, compressors, and associated ductwork, and new roof. But above and beyond those specific projects, the plan here marks the $460,000 across 10 years for capital improvements upgrades to the town hall RPD. So, which, which we just said. So, it's just how you, it's just semantics, it's how you look at it. It's the same amount of money, pretty much. So, um, in all this, if you take the spe specific upgrades that I mentioned, as well as that line, you've got $744,000 that can be earmarked uh, for this building. Uh, another uh, item of discussion was the two fire engine replacements in the CIP. And that discussion is made more complex by the introduction of the replacement to the RP chamber, which was sprung on us almost like an aside, you know, because we kept asking, is there something else? Is there something else? And so uh, the tanker, I guess, they were suggesting 2029, and it's there $50,000, so, which adds a big chunk to the CIP. And so, again, we had a, a, a lot of discussion about how best to manage all of that. And while members of the committee feel strongly that the CIP should be used to fund all the capital projects, we also feel strongly that you know, the increase in the average annual outlay could simply be overwhelming with those equipment replacements. And so what 
our strategy, and again, this is our record, this is just a recommendation, right? Your board is going to do what the board thinks is best to do. But so that we could complete our part of this recommendation, our strategy represented that we would bond the next fire engine to the tune of about six hundred thousand dollars, the one that's going to be in twenty twenty six in order to allow the CIP to fund the tanker completely and the second fire engine. And the expectation, or maybe the hope, is that then we would be on track and we could fund all the RFD vehicle replacements by the, by the CIP. Uh, two other highlights which I neglected to put in the executive summary, but which bear mentioning, uh, have to do with uh, a long discussion we had with the highway department, with our road agent, uh, with regard to equipment configuration. And, you know, the articulating lo loader is, I think it, it was called something else, but he, he uh, said we really should call it an articulating loader. Uh, he thinks that the combination of an articulating loader and a mini excavator provide the town with a lot more flexibility and value and would like to see those two eventually replace the bobcat and the backhoe. So if you look at the plan, the bobcat, which was moved to the transfer station, is zeroed out. It's there, but it's zeroed out. If you look at the backhoe, that's been zeroed out. And the dollars are in the articulating loader and the mini excavator. Does everybody see that? So that's the current thought that uh, George was recommending when he met with us. The, committee agreed, and that's what you see. We had some discussion about the articulated loader and uh, its cost, but that's where, we, where the committee ended up as far as the recommendation. Uh, the other thing that is interesting to note is under the transfer station, we removed the Quonset huts. I don't, I don't know if I actually just deleted them or whether they still do with zero dollars. Zero. Okay. Zero. Okay. So, because our road agent said he was going to manage uh, the functionality that it was looking for with the Quonset huts via the operating budget by constructing some um, some things, structures, <laughs> at, at less dollars, dollars. So those are some of the uh, highlights. There, there remain some uncertainties. Um, one is, of course, the uncertainty about a new building, a new town hall, um, as I discussed. Uh, there was also the issue about the town boiler, so I left it in there. You can see it's highlighted with zero dollars. When we met, there was some discussion about whether it, it would come out of the authorization that had already been approved in March, or maybe a delay of next year, or maybe it would need to be reauthorized. So, so it's there, zeroed out, with the, under, with the expectation that it would be installed and paid for with that authorization of 2019. But we kept it there just in case there's, there's a change in plans. Um, and then there's the LED lighting is on there too, at zero dollars. We don't know, we didn't know when that might happen, how much it might be, what the funding would be. So it's kind of there as a placeholder. Um, <clears throat> and then we uh, put together some things that might mitigate that leap in 2029 that could or could not happen, but um, I mean, clearly, you know, the, the CIP requests that, that come in in the years before 2020 through 2028, if there are ways to um, increase those requests, then that could be used to diminish that 2029. So, you know, if the board finds itself with either increased revenue or lesser operating budget or whatever, or it feels that the town would be willing to uh, uh, abide by a, a request amount different from what was currently in the CIP, then that, that, that increase could help defray you know, the, the 2029 request. Something else that um, I brought up to the board before by an email and, and just bringing up again, and that's the old Mill Lane Bridge replacement. And um, it's currently on the New Hampshire Department of Transportation's, you know, Bridge replacement list scheduled for 2027 with a total project cost of 965000 So what you see on the CIP is just the town's portion of that, so the 20 of the 80-20 split. But, you know, um, the board should keep in mind that during that project year, you'll need, 
you'll need to get short-term finance because it's a cost reversible situation. So you, you've got to spend the money and then you file your reports and get the money, the money back. But, but there, there's another possible strategy and that is you know, just continuing to replace the temporary bridge with other temporary bridges. The traffic on that is minimal because there are only two properties beyond it. So you, know, you can check with property owners, DOT, engineers, and see if that is a viable strategy and what that lifespan of the temporary bridge might be. You know, but a temporary bridge that costs 75000 with a lifespan of 20 years results in an annual allocation of $3,750 or less. And you know, part of the cost of that original uh, temporary bridge when I sat on the board was the guardrails that are in front of it. So they're not, they're not going to go away. They don't need to be replaced. So I don't know what the final cost was. But anyway, just something to consider. And to the extent that you can, you can reduce that $189,000 that's currently in the CIP, then that will help reduce the overall pressure on the CIP and, and can help mitigate that 2029 meet. Um, you know, would have to get DOT's um, blessing on that, I would assume, if that's what we would recommend. Well, I, it, it was on the bridge red list before, mm -hmm. so I think it, and it, we are in the, on, the, on the DOT's list to replace it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it would be a good idea, Denise, to, to check in with them and, and say, look, it, you know, you might want to have checked it with the engineer before, or, I don't know, but you know, if you went in and say, look, our engineer thinks, you know, it's perfectly safe, to have this kind of a bridge with this kind of traffic for this amount of time. Yeah. We just want to run it by you, so yes. There's no there's no possibility of being more than two houses over that bridge, right? I mean, is there... Um, I would without never, another never outlet... Never say never, but... Without another outlet to get out? Um, it's a dead end into a Class 6 road, so if the Class 6 road were to open up... Then is that that Class 6 road that was talked about? What was it? No. It's the Fresh Creek. It's Fresh Creek. It's Fresh Road. It's the other side. It's the other side. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I think on the right hand side of it, I don't know who owns that land. But I don't think there's available. I don't believe there is. Land. Or you know. But yeah. I mean, it just seems like if it's safe and it's only for two houses and it's safe and it saves us. And the state of ton of money. <laughs> it's a lot of money. A million bucks for, for two, two houses. houses. That, I mean, if it's never going to be any more than that, you know, I mean, it's, I don't know. But yeah, so I mean, that's, that's something to consider. Yeah, you know, you've got a little bit of time to, to mull that over. But um, <clears throat> Also, you know, should the board decide not to recommend a new building for Town Hall and RPD, that, that 744000 that's currently in the plan, it may be overstated, you know, who knows. As improvement and upgrades are more clearly identified, the process may cause a release of funding that can be added to other lines of the CIP. So, um, you know, again, as, as you get clarity on, on where that, where our facilities are going. Um, and then, you know, yeah, in, in case there's a miracle and, and, and certain things that we think are going to cost a lot of money don't cost as much, then that can be used. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I mean, our plan ends in 2029, and we don't really know what 2030, 2031, et cetera, came to mind, but that fire engine, that second fire engine is scheduled for 2035, I think. So, so depending on what sort of comes up for those years, then, then maybe you can actually make the, that whatever's left, I think they're, it's assuming an allocation of maybe 60000 for those ensuing years. I mean, maybe you can make it 70000 or seventy five, and take it off at 2029, so who knows. So the fire trucks added to them was based just on possibility of replacing them. It's I'm sorry, just, I missed it. Adding, adding the fire trucks to those was just saying, okay, what is it that you have in your building that is going to eventually have to be replaced? So these dates are could be extended based on usage and based on rust and all of those things that goes with a fire truck that causes it to be, have to be replaced. But it doesn't necessarily it's mean that those, it's a target day, right. right? So right. those yeah, absolutely move out for sure. Is, is gravy, right? Because right. that, that absolutely yeah. releases yeah. some of your money. So um, the, the other thing that I 
I will just offer as a suggestion. You know, we're trying we're trying to capture all of the vehicles and actually all of the large recurring expenses. And you know, we don't have everything yet. But, you know, because because obviously the tanker came up just this year. So and we put the command vehicle in the plan without a year, without an amount, just just to. That's a good word. Just so that we won't forget it. Yeah. So it might be interesting to see how other municipalities deal with what is a 10-year plan, but where do they put the stuff that's not in that 10 years yet, mm -hmm. so that they don't forget it, so that you know maybe they want to even start saving for it now because it's huge. I don't know, but it would be an interesting thing maybe to, to explore should anybody have the time. Um, and then. Uh, you know, bonding implications. I included the current um, repayment that we're under, just so that you can get an idea if, if you know, if you wanted to think about the recommendation that we bond the next fire engine, it will be right now. It's scheduled to be bought in 2026, so the payment would likely not begin until 2027. So you can see. You know, that's the last year of like where all three bonds are active, and then the following year, the transfer station falls off. Four years later, the, the old the fire engine bond falls off. So, yeah, that would just be helpful to see that. And, and I'm, I'm, that's all I have for the presentation for you. Here. Um, just to highlight also, so uh, a kind of a surprise thing was the extrication equipment for the fire station mm -hmm. that had not previously been on the plan, mm -hmm. but they um, were, the piece of equipment they have is the second oldest in the state. Mm -hmm. The first oldest is a backup to a backup mm -hmm. in Nashua. So yeah. this is not optional, right? Those are, that, that was donated by Janko years, oh, really? years and years and years. Well, let's go back to Shanko, see if there's anything. It, ha it highlights, you know, that we're still trying to get completeness on yes. this. Yep. Yep. Right? But it could be a backup. So, but now they've come up with new improvements. Oh, they're, not as big, yeah, not as heavy. They're, they're battery uh, operated. Battery operated. Yeah, there's so many different, different things so. that you can do, for sure. sure. And it, if you needed one, you want to have it on your trunk. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, absolutely. Now, hold on a second. Paving parking lot can come. Oh, you took it off. Yes. Because you know that's because, happening now. Oh, very good. It just, um, I think we, I think maybe our town administrator suggested that it get, get put on the paving schedule. So. Well, because we didn't know. Prior to. Prior to yeah. it last two yes. weeks ago or something, we found out that we had some extra um, uh, money from uh, the paving account. So there's some things that we can get done this year. So that will, well, he's prepped it already, but yep. it hasn't happened yet, but so we won't have to worry about that. Yeah, so I can sort of, let me go, go over, because I didn't do that explicitly, some of the um, outlays for 2020. So one is the, uh, the lease, leasing, mm -hmm. and we have extended the 10-year plan to include only leasing. So. So the years that you don't see as much money is because you know there's there's a there's no restarting or or something like that. I actually had it clearer in my head, but all of this is leasing. There's no purchase, and so you know Chief Dusharp said at some point they may come back and request that you know we start purchasing again. But right now he suggested that we carry it out with all leasing. So that that's what you see. So some I guess some years they're still just two leases active and other years, uh, all three. The, um, let's see, and that's it, that's it for police, just the vehicle leasing. Under fire department, as Miles just said, there, the extrication equipment uh, is new, but it seems that it's a safety issue, so we put it for this year. There's money in the you know, we jiggered, we jiggered with the, where the fund balance was, so it, it can come entirely from the CIP Reserve Fund. The forestry vehicle, um, most of it can come from the, again, while this wasn't new, I don't know that it was originally scheduled for 2020, do you remember, Miles? It was on it, but... I 
don't. I don't think it was. Yeah. I think they just they're having some major problems. Exactly. With it. So up, again, kind of went up the top of the line. Right. So, so we just got a, a ninety-two hundred dollar outlay, and the rest is coming from the CIP reserve fund, and that's the outlays for you know the, what would be more in article recommendations if the board goes along with this for the fire department. Under highway, it's the articulating loader, um, which is expensive, uh, 50000 of which is in the CIP reserve fund. Um, that's the only, I, I guess that's it for outlays. Mm -hmm. Digital fingerprinting. Um, I, I guess 2020. 20. Oh, I thought it's 2021. Yeah, yeah, I think that should be 2021. Because you've got green on 2021. Oh, I do, I see that. That's not correct. What's not correct is the purchase target year. That should be 2021. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, any questions? The uh, septic upgrade uh, under fire department. There was a lot of discussion about that. It's unclear. They haven't been having problems lately. So, we didn't want to uh, eliminate it altogether, so it's still there with $40,000. Um, and the other item under fire department that we should point out is uh, pave stabilize the front ramp. And we've got 20000 outlay, and in our discussions, we thought that it was probably too low. Are we looking to, to do that That's gonna, 26? That's going to be done sooner than that. It's going to have to be 2020. Either 2020 or 2021, yeah. if we're going to comply with yeah, stormwater storm and have as washing well. stations that have a drain that go into a water separator and all that, it would probably coincide with that or it would probably make sense to mm -hmm. coincide with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But we can put that out to 2021 because. You know, the, the year is different. The stormwater year we thought was September through August, but it's actually July through June. Um, so, nonetheless, we can put it off, but it would have to be in the beginning half of 2021 if we put it off. So, talking about septics, what is the reality that eventually they'll move sewer up to that? fire station. It's the will of the commissioners. And it's about the cost and, and whether or not, you know, and who would pay the cost. And that was part of the discussion that the CIP had, so again, you know, it was a, a great big unknown. So and it may, and it would probably require a booster pump. Yeah, yeah. But would it also require an enlargement of the sewer facility? Because no. we've been always told that they're at their max. The, the water, brown sort of water sort? Mm -hmm. It's not it. It's max, no. But that's what we were always told. It's mm -hmm. so capacity uh, in prior years. It was so capacity to other towns. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to, so we don't have anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And why did highway get put on a septic? You know? There's no sewer on that side. Yeah, the sewer there's stops at C&J. Oh, I mean, oh. it's, they went under the railroad track to give it to C&J, right? I believe so. So it's, that was built after C&J, right? Well, it was built in 2008, and I believe C&J was already out there. I can't tell you that, but C, all I can tell you is that C&J owns their pump station, their little uh, so booster pump. So I don't know if that was a factor. Hmm. Michael Point talks about um, what might be required to get the highway department on it. I mean, there's some little brokers. There's there is um, an issue that might make it a little more difficult. But Mike, I can I can talk to you about that. I've never had any conversation. Because uh -huh. I was surprised when I found out that they had when we know that the pipes have gone under the it was under the railroad. I believe it yeah. was. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Is he here? He was here. He Mark, he's here. Is he still here? Yeah, he's coming in. Oh, there he is. Have a nice evening. Have a good night, Suzanne. Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne. Stop by my own. Oh, right, right, right. I will. Come on up. Actually, I, I did put that, I did up the water rate in um, elsewhere. I, I upped this one a little bit because it's usually 166, I believe. Um, a quarter? It's currently 93. A total. Okay, but I, I suspect they're going to go up on their rates. I think it's, ni it's $93 for just water per quarter now, and I think you only pay for two quarters, is that right? No, I think that, so that would be $186. Yeah, I think it comes to 166 I believe. I, I oh, so what do they do, shut it off? So, yeah. And so you don't have to pay when you, do you have to, do you have to pay when they re put it back on? Or is it because of the no. department within no. the town, no. they don't have to? $186, it's two quarters, there's no turning off or turning no. off. Fees. Okay. Yeah, one one sixty six. I think. Oh, I thought it was kind of low for four quarters. So okay, yeah. if it's only for two. It's, then... So it's currently ninety three dollars. Okay. So. Yeah, I don't think I. Most positive. That's what I think they is one sixty six for total. So I don't know why they're charging us that. Well, they went up on all their rates in oh, January. Oh, this year? Oh, yeah, yeah oh, this right, year. Yeah, probably haven't got your bill yet. I'll, I'll get you a printout. I'll get you a printout so you can see where things yeah, are. Yeah, I haven't yes. seen it this year. So. Yeah. That would make sense because it is about that. Right. It was that last year. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. So, uh, any questions? Anything? Anybody? Now, is the cemetery cleanup done by the same people that do your mowing? Right. Okay. Yeah. And we used to do the uh, the Doe Cemetery cleanup, and I brought him out there this year. Uh, well, uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I brought him out there and asked him when I had him started doing that. Mm -hmm. 